Hey everybody, it's Dr. Wood here again, and today let's talk about uh, Lecture 4, P-Values and Significance. So some of the things we're going to look at is going to be P-Values and how they're actually calculated. Again, we're not going to do the calculations ourselves. Uh, we'll look at one and two-tail P-Values. We'll define the relationships between P-Values and confidence intervals. Uh, we'll talk about null hypotheses and what those mean, and uh, we'll look at results that are statistically significant and ones that are not. Um, we'll talk about things like uh, statistical significance from scientific or clinical importance. We'll look at statistical power. And then the concept of the equivalent zone. So let's start off by introducing a p-value. I'm sure most people have heard of a p-value before. In their research or article you've read before, it said, oh, the p was less than 0 0.001. The p was less than 0 0.05. Whatever the case may be, what the heck is a p? So let's define what the p-value is. So let's say you were to flip a coin 20 times and you found that 16 of the flips you had led to a heads and four two tails. The question is, well, how likely is it that that would have occurred? You would expect the probability of getting heads is 50%. And so you would expect that the majority of times you ran the experiment that 10 times out of the 20 flips, you would get heads and 10 times you get tails. So the question is, well, how small is that probability of actually getting 16 heads? It's probably not very high, but let's find out how high it is. And so, again, the assumption has to be made uh, that the coin itself is balanced, and it's a 50-50 chance, truly, that uh, of actually getting um, heads or tails. And so this is our null hypothesis, right? We say that, okay, well, there should be no difference um, between heads versus tails. You should be able to get either one 50-50, right? That's a null hypothesis. Um, again, we're expecting to be fair, so that should um, should be true, right? And you're going to find that in most examples, uh, the null hypothesis is something that the researchers are trying to prove false, right? Usually, we're going to find that the null hypothesis says there's no difference between two things. We're trying to say that, yes, there is a difference. Uh, if I'm trying to test a new medication out for a disease, and I say, well, placebo and drug treatment, there should be a difference between those two. The null hypothesis would be that, yeah, there's no difference whatsoever, okay? So again, whenever you're asking or looking at a piece of literature, ask yourself, what is the null hypothesis? Most of the time it's gonna be there's no difference in treatment, uh, there's no difference in the different outcomes, whatever the case may be, there should be no difference between the different groups you're comparing. So again, as we mentioned, since every coin toss has a possible outcome of heads or tails, it should follow a binomial distribution, right? It should be either one or the other. And so we want to know the chances of actually getting 16 or more heads here. So again, the question was, uh, if the coin tosses were random and the answers were recorded correctly each time, what is the chance that when you flip a coin 20 times, you'll observe 16 or more heads? Or conversely, you'll say four or fewer tails? And the answer is 1.19% of the time, you should get those results. If you ran the experiment 100 times, at least one of those times, you should get a result of 16 heads and four tails, right? And so, again, that's our p-value here. We're saying, well, what is the likelihood of getting this result versus any other result, right? And usually it's reported uh, fractionally, so 0 0.0119. And so asking the question is, is that if the null hypothesis is true and there's no difference between getting a heads or getting a tails, what is the likelihood of me actually getting a value that is this extreme, namely getting 16 heads, or more extreme, maybe getting 17, 18, 19 or 20 heads in this particular experiment here. Okay, so what are the chances this happened just by chance alone? Is what that p-value is saying. And this is saying that 1.19% of the time you should be able to get that result or something maybe even more extreme, right? So the p-value of 0 0.05, which is 5%, is pretty much used universally, and we'll talk more about what that is a little bit later, for statistical significance, right? So if you get a result that is so extreme that it happens less than 5% of the time by random chance alone, we consider that to be statistically significant, okay? Journalists use it as a guideline. We'll typically find that some people will use 0 0.01 as a result or as a p-value of significance. Some people use 0 0.05. That's the most common one you're going to run into. But basically the saying is that the results that we found were so extreme that it should happen by chance alone less than 5% of the time. That's statistically significant. And again, we said the null hypothesis is saying that there's no difference between uh, the population parameters that we're looking at, between the groups, saying that, okay, the groups, 
that we have here, whether they're getting, say, two different drug treatments or two different surgical strategies, whatever the case may be, there's no difference between those two there. And we're saying that p-value is basically just saying, you know, uh, what are the chances, just due to random chance alone, that these are the results we got, or maybe something even more extreme than that. What are those chances there? And saying that p equals 0 0.05 is saying that there's a 5% chance it's just due to, to chance alone, okay? Basically, we're saying that the smaller the p-value is, the stronger the evidence is that the null hypothesis is not true. So when you find a p-value that is less than 0.05, you can reject that null hypothesis with some degree of confidence, saying, okay, well, you know what? I don't think this null hypothesis is true. I'm going to reject that and say, no, there is a true difference between these groups because the results that we found are very unlikely to be due to chance alone. So again, when we're doing our statistical hypothesis testing, that p-value is a probability of getting that result that's at least that extreme or more so. And then once we've achieved that, then we feel confident we can reject the null hypothesis. And as we mentioned, at what level we do this is considered to be our alpha, right? So we look here at the significance level of alpha, which is usually less than, uh, less than 0 0.05, or in some cases it might be 0 0.01. Now keep in mind which one's harder to, to reach. 0 0.01, obviously, right? That's even less likely to be due to chance alone, right? But again, when we say that we can reject the null hypothesis, we say there is a difference between the two comparisons, we're saying that that is statistically significant. A bit of confusion is that some people feel the p-value is saying, well, this is just a probability of the null hypothesis being true. Um, it's not the same thing, right? We'll talk about different types of error rates. We'll talk about type one errors and type two errors. But basically what we're looking at here is that a type one error is when we incorrectly reject the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis was true. There's really no difference between the groups, but we have rejected it anyway. It's called a false positive. This is where we go ahead and say that there is a statistically significant difference here, but there actually isn't one. It's a type one error. You don't want to make type one errors typically. Type two error is when you incorrectly retain the false null hypothesis and you say well there is no difference between the groups when there actually was one there that's considered to be a false negative okay the p-value is just saying you know what is the chances that this result is due to chance alone it's not telling you what your type 1 error rate is okay um i will tell you that depending on where you set your p-value that can affect how many type 1 and type 2 errors you're going to make but again this is not saying the same exact thing we'll talk more about that in a moment so again, looking at the pitfalls, you're going to find uh, that the, the p-value does not actually tell you anything about the actual effect size that you found there. So there's very often times a case where someone can say, well, this is a statistically significant result, but it may be a one millimeter difference in blood pressure, right? Clinically, it doesn't really matter as you're going to find there. So you can find the really small differences. You can find really small statistically significant differences if you have a large enough sample size, right? So a lot of times it's based off the sample size you have, how big of an effect size you're looking for, um, you know, looking at the number of endpoints you're looking at, you know, this is that multiple comparisons problem you run into where if you keep looking for something, you're eventually going to find something just by chance alone, right? And so it's important the studies take into account these different factors here and they make sure they talk about them in ways that they try to prevent some of these errors from occurring. Now, if we were looking at the results of a study on, say, a normally distributed curve here, this is a Gaussian curve, remember that most observations should be falling here within the middle. If you remember, most things tend to follow or tend to fall towards the average or fall towards the mean, right? Because again, extreme values tend to cancel each other out as it turns out, and this is why you get that normally distributed curve. So the question is when we're looking at a p-value is we're saying, okay, well, how likely is it that we're gonna get a result that is in this very unlikely sort of uh, value side of things here, right? So again, we're looking for things that are not super likely. We're looking for results here that are very unlikely. And what are the chances that we'd get a value like that just by chance alone? So getting, you know, 20, or I'm sorry, getting 10 heads and 10 tails is pretty likely to occur because it's 50-50. Getting 16 heads and four tails is very unlikely. And so it's gonna be farther here on the right end of the curve here, okay? This p-value is basically what we're looking for in these, in these cases. So when you're looking at error rates, you're gonna find here that, um, again, H0 being the null hypothesis here. Let's say we have two instances where one, the null hypothesis is true, that there is no difference between groups, and then here the null hypothesis is false, and that there is a true difference between groups. 
here in this case here, say we find a statistically significant value, we get P of less than 0.05, and we reject that null hypothesis. Here in the case where the null hypothesis was true, this is a type one error. This is a false positive. We said there is a real difference, when it doesn't actually exist. It's a false positive. In this instance here where the false positive, I'm sorry, where the, the null hypothesis is false, and there is a difference between groups, then we've made the correct decision, right? We've got to the right conclusion. The flip is, off, is going to be true here if we do not reject the null hypothesis, meaning we get a p-value greater than 0.05 in most cases. In this case where the H0 was true, then that's fine. That's a good decision. We said there's no difference, and there is no difference. On the other hand here, when we fail to reject the null hypothesis, but there really was a difference here, it's considered a type 2 error. And you're going to find that there are different things that can contribute towards making each one of these. We'll talk about ways we can combat that. So let's go back to our example of body temperature that we were talking about before. And here we're going to try to define our p-value. So let's say that we have a, a, a normal body temperature that we hypothesized to be 37 degrees centigrade. And then using the data that we took out of the 130 people here, we found that their mean temperature was 36.82 degrees centigrade. Again, small difference, but there's still a difference there, right? And we want to find out, is this a statistically significant difference? Now here we're going to find that the 95% confidence interval range between 36.75 and 36.89. So we're saying here that we feel that if we were actually able to extrapolate this out to the whole population, that the average temperature would fall somewhere within this range of 36.75 to 36.89. So the question is, you know, and here you see that the confidence interval does not include the 37 degrees centigrade here. So it's saying, okay, there's a bit of a discrepancy, right? Because I was hypothesizing that it was 37 degrees. So the question is, well, what are the chances are that I would find a result that is this different from what my hypothesized value of 37 was? Because again, if I was to find no difference here, then this confidence interval should include that value of 37. And we'll look at this in a graph in just a few minutes here. So the question is, okay, well, is there a big enough difference here that there is a true difference between this group and the whole population? We can find that out with our p-value here in just a moment. And again, this discrepancy here between our sample mean and our hypothetical is 0.18 degrees centigrade. And when you actually got the p-value here, this p-value is basically answering, okay, if the population mean truly is 37 degrees centigrade, what's the chance that we're going to find a sample with an n of 130 people, that the absolute value of that discrepancy between the sample mean and our hypothetical mean of 37 degrees centigrade is 0.18 degrees centigrade or larger. So what are the chances of finding that much of a discrepancy between our hypothesized value of a population of 37 and our actual sample we had with an n of 130? And that p-value would actually equal 0 0.000018. So because this is a very small p-value, definitely less than 0 0.05, we would say that the very tiny chance that we would get a discrepancy like this just by chance alone. So in this case here, we'd actually say, okay, well, it's very unlikely. I'm going to reject my null hypothesis that by using the sample that 37 degrees is actually going to be uh, including that mean there. So because of that, I can reject that and say there is a difference between my hypothetical mean and this actual group here, okay? So again, by putting it into context here, um, again, you always have to interpret it. So how firm was the data in the first place? Well, how do I know that that average temperature was 37 in the first place? What data was I collecting that from, okay? Um, again, very frequently, you're gonna find that uh, that rule of thumb that most people are at 37 degrees centigrade is not based off of hugely overwhelmingly convincing data, but usually just rather tradition, right? So instead of actually memorizing, oh, the real temperature is 36 point, Eight, seven, most people just rounded to the 37, right? So perhaps in this case here, um, we had a false assumption going forward that said, well, maybe the average population temperature really wasn't 37 in the first place, okay? And this data here showing that to find this kind of discrepancy, that 0.18 degrees centigrade was very unlikely to occur if the population mean was actually 37, that is due to chance alone. So it probably means that our population average the hypothesis we had it was 37 was incorrect in the first place right this is one type of data or information that we can show by looking at this so that was with the n of 130 let's look at it when we use that smaller subset of data the n of 12. as you remember the variability is going to go up when we have a smaller sample size right so let's look at it now now we get a confidence interval that contains 
36.51 all the way up to 37.02. Now if we compare that back to our hypothesized population average of 37 degrees centigrade, we find that the p-value is 0 0.0687, meaning that the chances of finding a result the ranges between 36.51 to 37.02 would happen in nearly 7% of the time. Now because of this, because it's greater than 0.05, we can not reject the null hypothesis, and we cannot say that there is a true difference between this n of 12 and our population hypothesis, right? But you just said that, well, wait a second, this is just a subset of the 130. We had the 130, we said there was a difference there, but that's the thing. When you don't have a large enough sample size, you're more likely to make these kind of errors where you don't reject the null hypothesis when there really is a difference there. That's going to be a problem of power. And we'll talk about power in just a little bit. But remember, when smaller sample sizes are included, you're doing things like increasing that standard error of the mean so much larger, and that's also making your confidence interval a lot bigger. Okay? If you compare the confidence intervals between the end of 12 and the end of 130, say so this is much wider in context than the end of 130 was. So because of that, even if there was a true difference in that group, we didn't find it. And so we could not reject the null hypothesis, and this was not considered statistically significant. Okay, so there's a concept uh, between one or two tail p values. Now the question is when you're asking that, um, you know, do I use a one tail test? Do I use a two tail test? Um, basically, you're going to find um, that some books may call this one sided versus two sided. They kind of mean the same thing, basically. Um, the question is like, well, you know, what's kind of your your information going into the the into the experiment. Do you have an idea beforehand of which way your values are going to go? Who's going to be bigger? Who's going to be larger? Sometimes you have that information, sometimes you don't. But let's imagine we're comparing the mean of two different groups, right? And we'll look at them uh, based off one or two tail p-values uh, based off the same null hypothesis. If you're comparing two groups, your null hypothesis is going to be that there's no difference between the two. And if there is any observed difference, it's just due to chance alone, just random, just random chance. When you're looking at a two-tail or one-tail value here, the tails you're talking about are actually going to be the ends of this Gaussian curve, right? We said that the most likely values are always going to be in the center here. This is why this has the highest frequency. But as you get further and further away, the chances of getting a value this extreme is less and less, right? So when you're dealing with a two-tail test, you're going to be including both sides of this curve. Or a one-tail test will only be dealing with one side. The well, question is, well, how do you know which one to do? Well, if you don't know which way the difference is going to go between two different groups, if you don't know which one's going to be larger, which one's going to be smaller, you got to go off of both tails. You have to use a two-tail test there because you don't know which way it's going to go. Okay. If you're using a one-tail test, it's generally when you have a pretty good idea of whose value is going to be higher or whose value is going to be lower. Right? So that's kind of a general rule of thumb between the two tails there. In general, you're going to find that you're less likely to make um, a type 1 error if you're using a two-tail method. And I'll talk about why that is in just a moment. And so as we were saying, when you're using a two-tail p-value test, basically what this is saying is that given the null hypothesis is true, assuming that the null hypothesis is true, what's the chance of that randomly selected samples, my two groups, um, that w one or either of them are going to have the larger mean? And we don't know which one's going to have the larger mean there. And so in that case there, I have to look on either tail of the test to see if they get differences that, that large, essentially. With the one-tail test, you're going to find that you're only looking at one range. So, for instance, if I were giving, um, I had two groups, and one of which I was giving placebo to, and the other of which I was giving an antihypertensive to, you would assume that the patients with receiving the antihypertensive would have a lower blood pressure. So I can assume they would have a lower mean value than the people who had placebo, right? In that case there, I could use a one-tail test because I'm pretty sure I know who's going to have the lower value. I just don't know how low it's going to get as compared to placebo. You're more confident going in there, I know which way it's going to go, but what would happen if maybe they had a, a, a wrong reaction and they actually had a higher temp, uh, blood uh, blood pressure? You can see some, some problems with that. And so in general, you're going to consider the two-tail test to be more conservative, meaning that you're less likely to make an error with that and, and incorrectly conclude there's a difference when there isn't, i.e. a type 1 error, versus using a one-tail test. As I mentioned, it's only appropriate to use a one-sided when you know which way the difference is going to go. You know which group is going to have the mean that's larger. Um, but in general, use a two-tail test if you're not quite sure. Uh, most studies will say whether or not they use a one-tail or two-tail test. Your job would be to look for that. Um, again, if you find a true difference or you find that they're projecting the null hypothesis with a one-tail test, there may be a bigger chance that they're um, getting a, uh, a type 1 error 
let's look at a case here where we're trying to test a new antibiotic and seeing if it impairs renal function as determined by the serum creatinine. We know there's a lot of antibiotics that can damage kidney cells that can reduce our GFR and can increase the serum creatinine. Um, in this case here, we know there's known no known antibiotic that will decrease serum creatinine or increase the GFR. So because of that, I'm fairly certain that the people who are receiving the antibiotic are probably gonna have increased serum creatinine as compared to people who did not receive the antibiotic, right? All right so in this case here, because I know exactly which way the values can go, and know the antibiotic's not gonna decrease the serum creatinine, then I could probably get away with using a one-tail test there, right? Um, so in these cases, if you know it's an impossibility of, uh, of a, uh, sorry, a change happening, um, you can use a one-tailed test. But again, if you're not sure, just go ahead and use a two-tailed test. You're going to find your results are going to be more conservative. You're less likely to make one of those type 1 errors. And again, in this case here, it makes sense to calculate that one-tailed test because by using a two-tailed test, it would assume that there could be a chance that the creatinine would go down. And that really wouldn't be the case for most, m most chances there. Uh, very unlikely that that would occur. So a one-tailed test would be appropriate in this particular case. Uh, as I mentioned, the two-tailed tests are usually better in terms of being more conservative, meaning you're less likely to really find a result and reject the null hypothesis when there's nothing really there. And so because of that, the values of those p-values are typically bigger. And so again, it's harder for them to get less than 0.05. So you're maybe more likely to make a type two error by using a two-tailed test, but you're less likely to make a type one error. In general, you probably wanna be more likely to make a type two error than a type one error. You don't wanna say there is a real difference here when there really isn't versus you know maybe uh, failing to detect the difference when, when one truly is there, okay? All right, so let's talk a little bit about statistical significance and when we're actually testing our hypotheses and what that actually means for us. So basically when we do statistical hypothesis uh, testing, it's kind of making an automated process of decision making following the steps. So one, we define our threshold p-value as we mentioned usually being 0 0.05, that's our alpha that we're setting there. And then if our p-value ends up being less than alpha, we conclude that there is a difference that is statistically significant and at that point we decide to reject the null hypothesis, okay? And so when we say Hypothesis testing, there's kind of a unique meaning that we use there in statistics, and that's exactly what we're saying, is that we are seeing if our p-value is less than alpha, if that is true, then we reject that null hypothesis. You can kind of make the analogy that hypothesis testing is sort of like bringing someone on trial where we presume that someone's innocent until proven otherwise, meaning that we think the null hypothesis is true until we have enough data collected to say that the chances that the null hypothesis is true is so slim that we just need to outright reject it, right? So again, we don't necessarily say guilty versus not guilty. We simply say whether the null hypothesis is accepted versus being rejected. So when is hypothesis testing useful? You know, you may see it used occasionally in quality control, but not maybe so much in, in exploratory sorts of research. But basically by saying that, yes, we reject the null hypothesis or not, may not be may not be very useful for our purposes, right? Instead, by looking at p-values and confidence intervals, and by actually looking at how that actually assesses or how that correlates with the actual numbers, that's being presented there, um, we never have to really use the term statistically significant. The numbers can speak for themselves in those cases there. And it's better to actually look at the data rather than letting someone else tell us what the conclusion is. And so that's one of the things I wanna train you guys on in this class here is to not just say, oh, well, they said it's statistically significant, so I must be able to use this drug to treat this patient for this disease. Look at the data. You may find that maybe the p-value is less than 0.05, but maybe clinically, doesn't actually matter. Maybe actually no change in, in, in therapy is needed, uh, depending on the case there. So we'll look at some ways we can interpret that. That's where the journal clubs really come into handy uh, for those situations. So when you're looking at p-values, the question is, well, how significant is the result? So if you're looking at it and saying, well, is the result of a you know, p-value of 0 0.004, is that more statistically significant than the result of 0.04? Some say it probably really doesn't matter, right? It just means that the chances you found a result that is that extreme when if there was really no difference between groups it was much harder to find. It's much less likely that was occurring due to chance alone. The whole point, though, is not to just look to see whether the number is really small or not. It just you need to look at the actual numbers to see, like, okay, well, clinically, does it actually make a difference, right? Those are the things you should be looking for. Um, again, when you're looking at uh, a p-value and it comes at 0 0.049 or 0 0.051, does that mean that you can completely throw out the results of 0 
and totally accept as 0.4049. Um, again, you have to put it into context, right? Sometimes things can, uh, what we say is trend towards significance, meaning that, well, while we didn't exceed our value of 0 0.05, you know, maybe it was really close. And maybe if we redid the study and we had more pay people, or maybe we were looking for something a little different, maybe that would be significant then. So again, the context is super important in these cases there. Don't just look at a p-value and make any kind of conclusion about the data. Why do we set the value at 0.05? Why not set it much lower? Well, you typically find if you set a very low number, you're going to be very unlikely to make a type 1 error. I can set the p-value to say I need it to be less than 0 0.001, less than a 0.1% chance that the results that I find are due to chance alone. You're very unlikely to make a type 1 error, very unlikely to make a false positive sort of statement there. However, on the other hand, you're more likely to make many more type 2 errors, meaning that there is a true difference between groups and you should have rejected the null hypothesis, but you couldn't find it. Very frequently, you're gonna find that in order to find really small p-values like this, you either need to have an effect size, so the difference between groups was so huge that it was very easy to find the difference, or in some cases, you may need enough people in the study, enough ends, uh, so to speak, in order to make it so you can actually find that you need more power. And you know, I'll talk about power in just a second here. So the lower your p-value that you set it at, say lower than 0.05, the less likely you are to make a type 1 error, the more likely you are to make a type 2 error. And again, you are still going to make some type 1 errors if you use a, an alpha of 0.05. That means there's a 1 in 20 chance that you could be making an error. But again, that is what we've accepted as kind of the dogma. It's kind of what we've accepted as, as being significant there. Um, and again, you're going to find that depending on what you're looking at, p-values can change up pretty much, uh, pretty significantly here. But the alpha is generally what's going to be set here at 0.05. And it's kind of what we go with. So what is that relationship between confidence intervals and statistical significance? And as it turns out, they're very closely related. Um, again, when you compute a confidence interval, you're 95% sure that it contains the population value, right? And so what you find is, is that if that 95% confidence interval, if it actually contains, if the, assuming the null hypothesis is true, if it contains that population value, that mean that you think it is, and again, think back to that temperature example we were talking about before, if it contains what you think that population average is, then that would be considered to be not statistically significant because you said that you're 95% sure the population value fits within this range, and it, sure enough, it did, right? So there's no difference between the group that you had, that sample, and the actual population you're looking at. However, and especially in the example where we had an N of 130, we found that there was a, a statistically significant difference because that confidence interval did not contain what the hypothesized population mean was, meaning that there is a difference between the groups, the sample to the population, and thus it's very unlikely to be due to chance alone, and I can reject the null hypothesis that says they're basically the same. I'll show you some graphs of what that looks, at, uh, looks like in just a second here. But again, using our temperature examples, uh, in the subset of 12 patients, when looking at their information, we saw that the 95% confidence interval, um, which we knew included a bigger standard error of the mean because the N was lower, we found that the confidence interval contained that hypothesized value of 37, right? And we actually found that p-value was greater than 0.05, it was like almost 0.7. Now we're going to see uh, what that looks like in terms of, of uh, graphs, and I think it'll make a little bit more clear what we're kind of talking about there, right? And so looking at this graph here, we can see temperature on the x-axis, and basically here was our, our hypothesized population mean here, 37. And so basically what you're seeing here is our null hypothesis, right? So if the observed mean here, which is around you know, 36 point whatever, um, if that confidence interval contained the population average that we were hypothesizing, then you consider it to be not significant, right? So basically it would have to be, it could be up to, but not including that 37, and it would have been significant, but because it includes 37, when comparing that sample to the population, it is not considered statistically significant. The p-value is greater than 0.05. You're going to find that the N of 130 data is going to be a little different, though, but the standard error of the mean was uh, was smaller because we had a larger sample size. And so because of that, you're going to find that the, it causes our confidence interval to shrink down. And you can see here when we have an N of 130 that the value here, even though it was a little lopsided in terms of the confidence intervals, um, you're going to find that it does not include that 37. And so we could reject the null hypothesis and say that it does not contain the, that population mean. And so because of that, there is 
a statistically significant difference between these two. These two groups are not the same between the population mean that we expected versus the sample mean that we collected. So a basic rule of thumb you can, can have uh, when looking at confidence intervals and determine whether it's statistically significant or not, um, it depends on how you're, what kind of comparisons you're making here. So if you're looking at a sample compared to the population, if the 95% confidence interval contains the value of the null hypothesis, in the case of one slide ago, it was 37 degrees centigrade, if it contains that, then or does not contain that, then you know it must be statistically significant. If it does not contain that null hypothesis value, you know the p-value is less than 0.05, okay? I don't even have to know what the p-value is. I can just look at the confidence intervals and would be able to know that, hey, it does not include that, that uh, null hypothesis value. I know it is statistically significant. If it does contain the value, so like in the end of 12, when it contained 37, then I know that the results must not be statistically significant, okay? And again, this is represented by the result representing the comparison of the sample mean with the hypothetical population mean. You can use the same rule for other types of data as well. And this is what's gonna come up more frequently in the clinical literatures. Because oftentimes you're not comparing a sample to a population. More often than not, you're comparing two groups that you're comparing together that are both subsets of a population. But let's say for instance, we're looking at two different means of a group, right? So we have mean of group A and mean of group B, and we're subtracting the two together to see what the difference is between them. If you get something because here we're going to find that the level of significance is zero. If there's no difference between the groups and we subtract their means from one another, there should be zero difference, right? And so the value is zero. If the confidence interval does not contain zero, then I know those results have to be statistically significant. Or let's say I'm dividing one group by another. I'm dividing two proportions, right? A ratio of two proportions. And if there are no difference between the two, then that value should be one. And again, I'm gonna go into more detail on this later on, but just for, for, uh, for example's sake, if I'm comparing the ratios of two proportions together, if there's no difference, that value is one, right? 10 divided by 10 is, is one, 100 divided by 100 is still one. And so here, if I know that that value does not, that confidence interval does not contain one, then I know the results have to be statistically significant. So you'll get trained to a point where you don't have to look at the p-values anymore. Just by looking at the confidence intervals and knowing what kind of comparisons they're making, you'll be able to know whether or not it's significant, right? And you can wow all your preceptors and when you look super cool when you can do that. Uh, again, party tricks. Use it as a party trick and you may also be invited uh, as the, the really cool person at that party. So let's try to interpret a result that is statistically significant. So one big thing that people have a hard time with is trying to distinguish statistical significance from scientific importance or clinical significance. You can find plenty of results that have a p-value less than 0.05. And again, they may be due to very slight chances, but it could still be chances alone, right? So null hypothesis could still be true. Um, however, you may find that those differences there actually don't make a whole lot of difference in terms of being clinically significant. Like I said, you know, if you're comparing two treatment groups together, uh, testing a new antihypertensive versus placebo, and you find a one millimeter mercury of difference in blood pressure, would you really care even if it was statistically significant? Probably not, right? And so that's the important thing is try to figure out, well, okay, these results were significant, but does it actually matter to my patients? Probably not in a lot of cases. And so, again, like I said, a result is statistically significant when the p-value is less than the alpha, in most cases 0 0.05. And so in the temperature example here, you know, did the mean body temperature differ from the value of 37? Well, when we were looking at an N of 130, the p-value was extremely tiny. So yes, that was statistically significant. However, the difference between the hypothetical mean and that true mean was so tiny it really made no practical significant or difference there. So even though it was statistically significant, the real question is like, well, who cares? And if you can't answer that, then chances are it's not clinically significant. How about interpreting a result that is not statistically significant? Remember, not statistically significant does not mean no difference, right? Basically means that you were just unable to show a difference that was allowing you to reject the null hypothesis. Remember that you can make a type two error and not reject the null hypothesis when there really was a difference there, okay? Let's consider a type two error. And most of the time what that's gonna be due to is due to an issue of power, right? When you have a large p-value, that means that the difference as large as what you're expecting to see was 
probably more likely than not to be just due to random sampling, right? Doesn't mean there's no difference. It just means you weren't unable or you were unable to, to find it, right? You just couldn't find that difference that was that may or may not have been there. Um, so again, the p value does not or high p value does not disprove. I should say the high p value does not prove the null hypothesis is true. It just means you could not reject the null hypothesis. Okay, doesn't mean it's true. It just means you could not reject it. As an example here, there was a study in 93 where they were looking at routine use of prenatal ultrasound and seeing how it may improve perinatal outcome. Okay, So they basically randomly divided two large groups of pregnant women, uh, one of which received routine ultrasound exams twice during their pregnancy, and the other group received sonograms only if it was clinically necessary. And then they went ahead and compared the outcomes, uh, including adverse events, and they looked at morbidity and then mortality, and did look to see if there was any differences between the groups. And so uh, the null hypothesis here would be that the difference between the two groups would be identical, right? There would be no difference in, in between the groups. Uh, it doesn't matter how you got the ultrasound, that nothing different would happen there. That would be your null hypothesis. In this case here, we'll define what relative risk is later on, but basically means that there's no difference in risk between the two there. Um, the data ended up showing a relative risk of 1.02 mean that there was a 2% increase in the likelihood of an adverse event happening, right? Uh, they basically got a two-tail p-value of 0.86, and they had a 95% confidence interval 0.88 to 1.17. Now, in this case here, because we're actually um, looking at the ratios of two proportions together, if the data, if the confidence interval includes 1, then we know the result is not statistically significant. So in this case here, because it ranged from 0.88 to 1.17, it includes one. I know this result is not statistically significant. So in this case here, what does that mean? Well, does it mean that there really is no difference between getting routine ultrasound versus those who are just clinically indicated? Well, no. It just means that we could not reject the null hypothesis. We could not find a difference between the two if one so happened to exist there, right? And so by looking at that, you can interpret it several different ways, right? Let's do it a little bit more detail and kind of look at the, the actual differences and in, in, um, the results here, right? So again, getting the routine ultrasound versus when it was indicated. Here you can see what the, the risk was between the two. If you divide 0 0.05 by 0 0.049, that's where you get that relative risk of 1.02. They found that the routine ultrasound group had an increased risk versus only when it was indicated. So by getting more ultrasounds, they're a bigger risk. Now again, the results were not statistically significant. But let's kind of kind of prod a little further. See, like, well, what the, what was going on there? Why does it appear like getting more ultrasounds make you a bigger risk? Okay. So a couple of different ways you could look at that. One of which is that the confidence interval was centered around one. It was pretty narrow. Um, so again, it looked like that the routine ultrasound was neither helpful nor harmful. Now the confidence interval is narrow, but maybe not all that narrow. You know, it makes sense because, again, um, looking at this, we would see that by getting more information, by doing more ultrasounds, we may be able to, be able to kind of pick up on things uh, more easily because you're getting more ultrasounds done. Maybe you can help direct care a little better there. But notice here the confidence interval goes down to as low as 0.88, showing a risk reduction of 12%. So, again, it doesn't prove that it's beneficial, but maybe leaves the possibility that if you were to maybe um, do a bigger study or do it again, you could find that the bad outcomes could be reduced. Or in this case here, confidence interval goes up as high as 1.17, meaning there's a 17% increase in problems. Would that mean that the ultrasound might be harmful? Who could say, right? Um, but again, the results ultimately are not statistically significant, so I cannot reject the null hypothesis. I cannot say there's a real difference between the groups here. Ultimately, it's open to interpretation, right? So you may need to correlate this with other studies. Maybe you need to look at, well, what were the benefits and risk? Maybe they weren't looking at it, right? Maybe they were um, you know, having not looking at things like the reassurance of having more routine uh, visits with providers, increased bonding. Maybe there are some issues of not early identification, intervention, a lot of different things here, right? Oftentimes what you're doing when you're looking at the literature is saying, well, how would I have done this differently? What things would I have been looking for had I been running this study that maybe they were not looking for here, right? Those are things you want to start to think about when you're reading the medical literature.
So how to get more narrow confidence intervals. Again, you can try to improve your methodology. So hopefully get less variation in the data that you're picking up. The other thing you can do though is increasing the sample size, right? By increasing your sample size, you get a smaller standard error than mean, and thus you get smaller confidence intervals. As an example here, if you increase the sample size by a factor of four, confidence interval should narrow by a factor of two, right? So it just goes to show you that if you want more narrow confidence intervals, get more people involved in your study. So that kind of goes into talking about statistical power though. What is power? Power is basically the ability to detect a difference should one actually be there. So if you don't have power, you're gonna have an issue of a type two error. Remember type two error means that we did not reject the null hypothesis when we should have. There was a difference there, we just could not find it. And to find it, you need more power, right? Kind of thing like Tim the Toolman Taylor, you gotta have more power, right? Um, oftentimes power is directly related to the sample size you're dealing with. And again, a lot of times you're gonna read in the medical literature, especially if they have a small sample size, this study was underpowered. Meaning they didn't have enough people to really find a difference when one should have been found there. How do you determine what the power should be? Um, basically, that's gonna be determined by the false negative rate, which is considered to be beta, and so power is equal to one minus beta, which is considered to be your sensitivity. We'll talk more about that later. But basically what people can do is they can do what we call power calculations, where they actually determine how many people they need to include in their study in order to find the difference that they're looking for. And if they don't meet that number, then they can say, well, we probably weren't powered to find a difference. And that can lead you to say, okay, well, they didn't find any significant results. And that could be why, is because of the underpowered nature of it. It's a power analysis or the power calculations we talked about there. Um, and again, another big thing to, to look at also is going to be the sample size that they're looking at. It's going to be the, the effect size they're looking at. So are you looking for a 10 millimeter mercury difference in blood pressure? Or are you looking for, say, a, a 20 millimeter mercury difference? It's easier to find bigger differences than it is to find very small differences, right? So that can affect power pretty significantly. And then we'll also look at whether or not we're using parametric or non-parametric tests. That'll become important a little bit later on in this class. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. So an analogy to understand power, I, I really like this analogy uh, quite a bit now that I'm a, a father of two children. Um, so let's say, uh, for instance, you're gonna send your child to the basement to find a tool. Uh, obviously being in Florida, no one has basements here, but let's just assume, let's use the, the theater of the mind. Um, and so she comes back and she says, it isn't there. So what do you conclude? Was the tool really not there? What's the probability that tool is really not there? So the question to answer is, is that, again, what is the probability the tool is really not in that basement? And another way to think about it is, if the tool's in the basement, what is the chance that your kid would have actually found it? In case of my kids, probably not very good, but let's look at the different factors. So to estimate that probability, you have to know three things. So one, how long did she spend looking? So this is basically analogous uh, uh, to the sample size. A larger sample size means you have more power to find an effect, right? To find that tool, meaning she had more time maybe to go look for that, that tool. How big is the tool, right? So how big is the effect size? Are you looking for a very large difference between groups or are you looking for a very small one? Are you looking for say a jackhammer or a shovel or are you looking for a tiny Phillips head screwdriver, right? The bigger things are easier to find. And then how messy is the basement? This is analogous to experimental scatter or how much standard deviation you have in your data set there. So again, it's a very messy basement. It's gonna be harder to find stuff than it was a very clean and pristine sort of basement there. Very little variation in the data, okay? So maybe it's not the kid's fault they couldn't find it. Maybe there's just too much variation in the data, right? Or maybe it's too small of a tool for them to find in the first place. Let's answer a few questions to wrap this up. Um, is the p-value the probability that the null hypothesis is true? No, the p-value is basically just saying that if the null hypothesis is true, how likely is it that we would have found this result, right? So it's not the probability that it is true, it's just saying like, what are the likelihood that we would have found a result this extreme, right? Is the p-value the probability that the result was the result of sampling error? No, p-value is basically consumed, or is computed assuming the null hypothesis is true and that all the differences are based off of random sampling, right? Is that we're, when we're interpreting the p-value or deciding whether to reject the null hypothesis or not, the p-value is just made to saying like, how likely is it to have occurred assuming the null is true? Does a high p-value prove that the null hypothesis is true? No, it basically just means that we can't reject it, right? It just basically means that we did not achieve our level of significance. It means that maybe there is a difference there, we just don't know about it, 
right? Maybe we need more people to look at it. Maybe we need less variation in the data. Who knows? We just can't throw it out yet. Can p-value be negative? Nope, p-values are always between zero and one, right? Make it very close to zero, but never go beyond zero. Is a p-value always associated with a null hypothesis? Yes, if you don't know what the null hypothesis is, then you don't really know how to interpret the p-values. And that's gonna be one of the big things I always want you to look at when you're doing your journal clubs or when you're looking at the literature, is like, what is the null hypothesis? Because they probably won't state it out explicitly. They won't say, we think our null hypothesis is X, Y, and Z, but you should be able to determine what it is based off the context clues in the article. Is it possible to uh, report scientific data without using the word significant? Yes, you can just look at confidence intervals and p-values. Never have to say that you achieve significance, um, but again, be very careful if you just uh, believe someone based off saying, hey, we found some significant results here, right? Is the concept of statistical hypothesis testing about making decisions or about making conclusions? It's by decision-making, right? We're deciding whether or not we think we can throw out the null hypothesis or not, and then we can interpret things based off of that. Are p-value and alpha the same? No, p-value is something we're gonna be using to see if we get past our alpha, which again, normally alpha is set at 0.05. If it does get past that, then we can say, okay, we have a statistically significant result, okay? Is the p-value the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis? No, right, you reject the null hypothesis when p is less than alpha, okay? When you get a p less than 0 0.05 or less than 0 0.01. Whatever you set alpha at, once you get below that, that's when you can reject the null hypothesis. That's it for this section. If you have any questions, please let me know, and I'll see you in class next time. Thanks a lot. Bye.